Balaji Abdullahi is the spokesperson of the ruling All Progressives Congress APC. He is also the former minister under the administration of President, ex President Goodluck, Abele Jonathan. Bits of his soon to be released book on a platter of gold, How Jonathan Won and Lost Nigeria as Ruffled Feathers. Former Governor Olusegu Mimiko of Ondo State has actually threatened to sue. Reno Omokri, a former aide of President Jonathan, has actually called the book Tissue of Lies. Malam Baladi, what can you say about the remarks, the feedback you've gotten so far? It's quite interesting, but um, I think um, it's very significant what has happened. And for me, the significance is that we are writing at all. Uh, regardless of how people interpret the efforts, I think it's very important that anyone who had the who has had the opportunity to be in the public service should come out with some kind of story. It's very important for memory because we seem to be in a nation that's in a hurry to forget. You know, and because we're in a hurry to forget, we tend to repeat our mistakes. So what I wrote here, uh, bringing the experience that I've had as a journalist and an editor and a student historian uh, to bear, is an account of what transpired in that era, the Jonathan era, and also um, an analysis of how certain things happened in a particular way. Yes, I'm a journalist and um, I'm not a fiction writer, so, so I didn't uh, write fiction, I didn't cook up stories, you know. Um, I, and I, if you listen to people the way they're coming out in the last couple of days to say, oh, this didn't happen, he said this happened, this didn't happen, you will actually think that um, I should be awarded a Booker Prize for fiction, <laughs> if I could imagine all this. I will, I will say that people who uh, are understand, people who are now coming out to see, they should be understandably embarrassed because maybe it's a story they thought or hoped will not get out. So when stories like that um, come out, um, people will want to, uh, in panic, deny that those things happen. But I think we are doing injustice to history. You know, some things should be bigger than us. Some, some things should be greater than us. We are a totality of our successes, our failings, our foibles as human beings. With due respect, I think uh, Governor Mimiko is not telling the truth. Uh, when he denied that he actually asked the Attorney General at the time to issue a fiat for someone to prosecute President Buhari for 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 forgery, for certificate forgery. You know, I had my sources, I had everything in chat. I left I left journalism as a senior editor in this country, so I know what I'm talking about. Are you at any point angry that could love Jonathan Sachi? No, not at all. Not at all. I, I actually think if I was President Jonathan, I would have sacked me. Yeah, because uh, look, it's politics. At the time that President Jonathan wanted to, he made up his mind to contest this in 2015. And he was playing his politics the manner he was playing. And um, at that point, he needed um, lieutenants who were 100% uh, loyal to him. You know, and don't forget, uh, it was a zero sum game. Right. You are either for me or, or you are against me. I had my own, I had my own allegiances with people that have come a long way, you know, since from the same place over forty years. Doctor Saraki specifically. Unfortunately, they were they, they were in opposing <laughs> camps. You know, I didn't choose camp. I was working with both President Jonathan. But he needed me to lead his uh, political onslaught in, in my state. Uh, it's something I was not able to do because my upbringing would not allow me you know, to openly uh, stand against someone who gave me my initial opportunities that allowed me to become a minister. So I, that was, it, was a, it was a principled position that I took. But if you take a position, if you, if you stand for something, you should also be prepared for the consequences. You, it's hypocritical, you know, that you want to start for something that you don't want consequences. It's hypocritical. 
So I stood for something and the consequences came out fine. And I think at that point, I was not the kind of person that President Jonathan needed. Right? right? He needed someone that he believed was 100% loyal to him. Loyalty at that time meant someone that could stand and fight Dr. Saraki. I was not that person. So he did what he had to do. I don't have absolutely. I should actually, I am very grateful to him for giving me the opportunity. In chapter 5 of your book, you did talk about the subsidy and the good luck administration, uh, Jonathan administration. Was there any time at FEC where you guys had a conversation about the subsidy? After the fact, after the fact, we, we were all surprised when the announcement came on January 2012 that flood subsidy was given. Every member of the Federal Executive Council was as surprised. We were, we were taken by surprise because we knew it was coming. But the agreement was that we'll come back in the new year and continue the conversation and look for the best possible way to do it. You know, but of course the moment it was announced that the president owned it, then we had to line up behind the president. So if any conversation happened around it at all, it was after the protests had started and looking for ways to mitigate the implications of those. You know, but there wasn't any 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 time that the cabinet sat down to take a decision that the subsidy should go on a particular day. And if you recall, even the Minister of Petroleum uh, Resources, uh, Mr. Zenayali Semadike, that people uh, like to hold responsible for some of these things. Uh, she, was in, she, was in, she was attending the Commonwealth Head of Government meeting in Australia and made a commitment that no subsidy would not go until Nigerians have, have, have finished consulting about it. The Minister of uh, Finance, uh, Dr. Mbuzi Okoje, uh, was out of the country when it was announced. She didn't know about it. So, I, I tried to get an insight, even I as uh, I tried to get an insight from uh, President Jonathan. It was one of the questions that I wanted to pose uh, to him to ask him, who advised you to remove first subsidy on January 1, 2012? You know, but unfortunately, I think uh, he wasn't able to, to respond to that question. In chapter 7 of your book, where you tagged that um, Boko Haram and other demons, you Miss the point where your predecessor, Alajilai Mohammed, did condemn the fact that Boko Haram should be designated a terrorist organization. Do you think this was responsible? No, I didn't get that. Take that idea. In chapter 7 of your book, Boko Haram and oh, other demons. demons yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. You missed the point where Lai Mohammed did issue a statement at some point where he categorically condemned the federal government's actions to, to designate Boko Haram as a terrorist organization. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, you couldn't have written everything. And, and I'll agree with you that that's probably a blind spot. Right. But let me say clearly that I did write this book as APC spokesman. Right. I said writing this book shortly after the election. I did become APC spokesman about almost a year after. Right? So, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's um, I can understand, you know, but I will want to say that anyone looking at this book shouldn't look at it as an AP6 spokesman, right? Right. right? right? It's a bit awkward, but it's not an AP6 spokesman writing. As I write in this book, and if you look at the trajectory, you see that it's not something that was written uh, from November. So, whatever Live One I said or did not say, I'm not accountable for that. So, I don't know, I don't know why he would say all those. But I wrote based on what I saw, what I had, and what I read, and sometimes from original sources, you know, I had access to some documents that they are not generally available to the, to the public on the issue of Boko Haram. And I tried to use all this to construct a narrative of what Boko Haram truly represents, uh, represented from Nigeria. Do you think the president made the right decision? I mean, you did when you talked about the Chibok girls release and swapping them with the terrorist organization. The government has already swapped, um, allegedly swapped some of the criminals in exchange for the Chibok girls. And some people are saying the resurgence of the attacks we're noticing right now is as a result, is as a result of the swap. Do you think Jonathan made the right decision by, by refusing to swap the, the the, the criminals for the girls. You see, I only say one thing. The president of Nigeria is the only one who has access to all the information. No one else has access to all the information. Right? 
And because he's the only one who has access to all information, every other person knows what he or she knows only on a need to know basis. The president knows. So based on the information available to President Good Dr. Nathan at the time, he may have concluded that it was not the right way to go or in, in, in terms of solving the problem of Boko Haram. Maybe President Buhari had access, had access to a different kind of intelligence or a different kind of information that advice. So we cannot possibly say uh, because a particular president responded this way at a particular time, then the subsequent president also have to behave uh, in a particular way. I think based on the based on the on the on the on the constellation on the constellation of facts and information available, the president will have to take a decision. Whether it's the right decision or wrong decision will only be determined by the consequences of those actions. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? So it is what did you intend to achieve? Now the choice that you made did it lead you to the outcome that you anticipated or that the people anticipated? So if your, the choices you made did not lead to that outcome, then we cannot say the choice was right. Do you understand what I'm right. saying? Yeah, so that it's, I think it's in that context that we have to look at the decision that I think. A total of nine ministers were actually sacked on the same day. Are you saying they, they, all of them were sacked based on for political purposes and not corruption or incompetence at some point? I am not aware that anyone was sacked because they were corrupt. In fact, right? most of them by that time were still in the party. Um, and the president at that time did not say that he sacked them because uh, they were corrupt. In fact, no reason was given. Right? It was just announced that this is following that. And it's absolutely within the president's prerogative. He didn't have to give a reason to sack him. Right? So he asked those ministers to go. But in retrospect, when we begin to contextualize all this, begin to find meanings to them, begin to find, um, make, um, build them into a narrative, we now begin to say, find patterns, right? And based on those patterns, we now begin to make conjecture that it's possible that these people, after eliminating X, Y, Z, so it's possible that these are the reasons that. Because don't forget that we're heading towards, at a point, we're heading towards a point where President Jonathan had to decide whether he was going to run again or not. And it was also at that time that many people were telling him that, look, he, he brought several ministers in who were not politicians, people like Dr. Shamsuddin Nusma, people like Mama Ama Pepo, and the rest of them. You know, they were not politicians. They were those technocrat people who were competent in what they do. But at that point, President Jonathan was looking ahead to contest the elections and probably felt that he needed people who could help him to win politically. And if you look at the people he replaced those people with, like Shekarao, for Shamsuddin, right, then you begin to see that there is a pattern that shows that politicians were being brought in as technocrats were being shit out. So you can conclude based on, on, on that kind of permutation that. I would digress and ask you about that night. For someone who was the Minister of um, Power and was also involved in the process, don't you think that was conflict of interest at some point? Well, like I tried to reconstruct in the book, Batinaji uh, said he told the President about he declared his interest and the President didn't find anything wrong with what he did, you know. Uh, but I think at the point some other people called the President's attention to it and said, look, you cannot allow yourself to be put in a position where you'll be taking bullets for your subordinates, they should be taking bullets for you and you not and not you for them. You know. So what what um, uh, Professor Naji uh, said was that whatever interest he had in this company, geometrics that he had put them in blind trust. You know, but some other people pointed out that look blind trust does not allow your wife to manage the company, you know, so and, and all that dynamics. But if you talk to Bati Naji will have his own story, right? But at that point, um, President Jonathan probably needed to ask him to go. And in retrospect, it's interesting actually that in retrospect, when President Jonathan was given instances of uh, actions he took against um, corrupt officials in his government, but in this case was one of the examples he used, right? But at that point, no member of the cabinet or few members of the cabinet that you see 
will think that Vaz Energy was asked to go because he was corrupt. Many people felt that okay, okay, maybe he bad judgment, he was guilty of bad judgment and all that. But not outright corruption. He's not the kind that we we, we saw subsequently. We hear President Jonathan was your was your fan. I mean, was also a fan of your achievements when you were working um with him. Did he at any point speak to you before you were sacked? No, 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 no. Or after? No, 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 never. I actually don't think that's his style. For for some reason, I don't think that's his style. I don't know of anyone that has to leave his government that will tell him that President Jonathan calls him and warns him in advance, except some other people that were, had other kind of relationship with him that I knew him at a personal level, not just at official level. You know, um, I didn't know I was going to. I, honestly, I must say that I expected it because, like I said, if you if you made the choice, you should expect consequences. So I I wasn't caught by surprise. He's, he's a, he was a fine gentleman. Um, I knew that he respected the work I was doing, and he didn't. If he had his way, he wouldn't. He wouldn't ask me to go. But I think there were forces that were pushing him from a political point of view that my continued presence uh, would endanger his political interests. Have you met him since then? No, but I, I, I've not met him. Uh, but I, 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 I tried to reach him when I was writing, writing this book. I tried to reach him. And uh, we had a very good conversation on, on WhatsApp, and um, I was to come over to, to ask him a couple of questions, but I think um, at the point he felt differently and we were able to go out with it. You did talk about your relationship with Dr. Bukala Salaki. It, it's common knowledge that you're loyal to him. Um, at what point did you feel the need that, why did you not resign before you were sacked? Because I didn't feel the need to resign. I felt what I was doing was more important than any other thing. And let me say here that Dr. Sarkey never invited me to his whatever he was doing. Never, ever. Never invited, never discussed it with me once that, okay, I'm going to leave PDP, I want you to come with me, or I want you to be loyal to me. No, 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 we, he never came. Right? In, 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 in fairness to him, he never put me under any kind of pressure to do this or not to do that. Maybe he had expectations, but he never discussed it. But like I said, you see, I, my father would tell me that if someone had ever done you a favor, no matter what, always remember where you come from, right? I was in the newspapers in 2003 when Dr. Saraki invited me to come and work with him as a special assistant. Under him, I became a special advisor. Under him, I became a commissioner for education, which is my passion, right? And if he didn't put my name on the list of nominees from Quara, I'll probably not become a uh, minister. So I don't think it is moral. I will be betraying my, the lessons from my father if at that point all the opportunities that have given me accounted for nothing. Let me tell you what happened. We went to Quara, we followed the president of the rally to Quara, and everyone was coming out because Saraki had left PDP and he became the arch enemy of the president. So. Uh, and we're all asked to come out and be talking on the stage and abusing him and all that. And I said, no, I wasn't going to do that. That was all. I said, I, I wasn't going to be a part of that. I, for the life of me, carry a microphone and be abusing my father with that. <laughs> you know? So, if that situation did not happen, that I was put in this room where I had to come out and be attacking him, I would probably still remain in, 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 in government. You, you get what I'm saying? Right. So it wasn't that, okay, so I can ask me to come, so I had to resign. No, it, it didn't happen that way. But let me also say that I I I knew that I I could have, I was almost sacked before then. Right? My When those nine were ministers were sacked, I was supposed to be the tenth minister on that list. It was that morning as the president was announcing the date of those nine that he cancelled my name. You see, so it's political, it's nothing else, right? That was long before what happened and eventually happened. What saved me that day was, was that same morning that I presented an athlete to the Federal Executive Council who just won a medal. So I think some people pointed out the contradiction. How could you, the same day that this guy just brought glory and you sat him? You know, so I, I think that was like my name. That's what saved me that day. So it was only a matter of time, you know. But the, if I was left alone to do my work, I would I would probably not have to decide and all that. 
Um, apparently, Stella Odua and Daisy Anyanis um, were members, active members of the kitchen cabinet during the last administration. Whether the lovers of the president has portrayed a little bit since I got from the book? I, didn't, I don't know. I, I don't know if they are lovers of right. the president, like you said. Right. But like I said in the book, they had relationships that are not official with the president. And there are all kinds of relationships you could have with people that are not necessarily official. But to conclude that those relationships were amorous or they were lovers, I don't have the information to make that conclusion. And I was nowhere in my book where I said where I said that, you know. She was widely seen as Jonathan Studio Patra. Yes. But this does suggest Including people like yourself. <laughs> That's an allegation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, but it just sort of paints a picture of some sort of sexual relationship at some point. No, but that's what I said. I mean, an average Nigerian, that's why I say why he's seen an average Nigerian somehow have con uh, has concluded that these two have some kind of um, romantic relationship where romantically they work with each other, right? That was not my position. I was only saying that, you know, and, and if you remember, if you, if you read that passage again, I remember it clearly. I said, even if this was not true, right, there was nothing in the way they carried on that disproved those... What do you mean by days and he was out of his league? I mean, look at her background, look at his background, right? He was, by his own declaration, had no shoes when he was growing up, son of a fisherman. She was a child of an editor. She was a, a princess. She was, she was the daughter of a shell executive. She had a protected upbringing. She attended some of the best universities in the world. She went to Howard. She went to uh, Cambridge, right? As being president, isn't that enough? Yeah, I mean, but it was, it was being president that actually brought them together. That's the point, that if he was not president, there was nothing in, the, in their two backgrounds that would have brought them together. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? You know, so the, if, if he remained a lecturer, in the, uh, the, the, uh, the College of Education that he was teaching, right? It's unlikely that their path will have crossed. It's quite unlikely that their path will have crossed. You know, when he became... Was that condes of, wasn't that condescending on the part of the president? That one? That he, he wasn't on her league? No, 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 I don't think so. I wouldn't have been on her league. I wouldn't have sat in the same room with her if... I didn't become a federal minister. My father was a tailor, my mother was a petty trader. So what would have brought us together? Do you, do you get what I'm saying? So there's nothing condescending about it. My background is my background. And the president himself was the first to say, look, I had no shoes growing up. So what's condescending about that? About that? Desani would never say she had no shoes growing up. Right? <laughs> Interesting. You said a lot about ministers, the fact that ministers doubted Aki Adeshina's claim. Of the administration. What side of this argument are you on? I'm a storyteller and I try to listen to a lot. If you're a storyteller, you have to learn to listen to, to stories. Um, for me, I don't have enough evidence to, to say this is where I stand. I think in between, in between those two extreme positions, you will find the truth. On one side are those who are saying he didn't achieve anything. I think that is wrong. He achieved a lot. On the other side are those who will say he achieved everything. That is not true. He didn't achieve everything. But I think he was one of the best ministers of agriculture we've ever had in this country, regardless of what anybody else did. But at that point, several of our colleagues feel that um, his achievement was being exaggerated. Uh, they probably have their evidence in terms of real productivity, agricultural outcomes, food security, you know. So, because in agriculture, what people tend to use in measuring success in agriculture is that you have food everywhere, right? You have food in the market, you have food in the silos, and they are, we don't have issues uh, of, of having to import food. But we're still importing. So, some ministers were saying that, look, you know, and again, don't forget that there will also be professional library. 
you know, why is this minister getting all the hype? Why is it being, you know, if you have two children and you always say, look at Mercy, why can't you be like Mercy? Then you can only have the other child growing to be resentful of Mercy for, for just cause of a no just cause. Do you get what I'm saying? So I, I don't think it's not, it's not about what I think. I think it's about the, the, the relationship that was built around additional performance, you know, and how the, the claims or counterclaims of performance. I give an example. Now, the time he was, uh, he came to the Federal Executive Council to say the ministry has created 1.2 million jobs, right? If I remember the figure correctly, it's middle. You know, the, the President's National Economic Advisor took him and said, no, I don't have any evidence that 1.2 million jobs were created in your ministry. The National Bureau of Statistics uh, did not report to me. I did not find anything in their office that says 1.2 million jobs were created by your ministry. And the argument went on and on and the president had to say, look, enough, stop it, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there were those kinds of disputations. But what I'm saying is that the, all this set the stage, right, for what eventually happened after the election, which is actually the story. Final, final thoughts let you go. Do you honestly think the government of good luck, Jonathan, failed? Which we are part of, anyway. No, I don't think so. I think the politics failed. Right. I, I, I don't think good. I think President Jonathan had a vision. I don't think, I don't care what anybody else says, you know. I think he, he, he wanted to get somewhere. And he had a good team. He wanted to get somewhere. But he, he didn't get the politics. You see, no matter how much technical soundness we have around him, if you don't get the politics right, and that's why the, some of the things they teach you in Kennedy School, that the, the best policies are those that are politically sound. <laughs> right? You know, so he didn't, I think, get the politics right. He made a couple of um, wrong choices. He accommodated certain things he probably shouldn't have accommodated. You know, so at the end of the day, all this overwhelmed, all those fantastic achievements that he had, and all those fantastic attributes he had of personal qualities, uh, he's a human being, good human being, right? And so I think all this, um, you know, for example, on the issue of corruption, I don't think even his worst enemy can accuse Dr. Jonathan of being a corrupt person. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I've not seen anyone in this country that will say Jonathan is personally corrupt. If you'll be saying so, I think you can be accused of non chapter. Thank you, Madam. Right. Thank you for having so. me. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and that's it. Thank you so much for joining us. That's a wrap for now. Thank you, Madam Balaji, and have a great day.